Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to RASC Toronto Centre. Uh, we are online tonight, uh, sort of per usual, and I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of RASC Toronto Centre. This is our February 2022 Speakers Night presentation, a very auspicious uh, date, 02-2022, um, and this is one of two types of gatherings that days, not at the Ontario Science Centre due to the pandemic. Uh, our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about various programs later this evening. But first, we have a very special event to kick off. And to get us started, uh, per usual, I'd like to actually go ahead and acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. These lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Metis, and Indigenous peoples from Cross Turtle Island. As we engage in astronomy here together, we respect, learn from, and honour the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and Earth. Um, so we have all kinds of uh, wonderful things happening tonight, in the skies in particular, because for tonight, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome Vivian Tan. Uh, she's an um, MSc and a current PhD candidate at York University as well. And I just thought a little bit of an introduction was in order for our fantastic speaker. Vivian obtained her Bachelor of Science with Honours from the University of Toronto, majoring in physics and astronomy. And actually, she w did research in exoplanets, which you're not going to hear about tonight, but I thought was really cool. Uh, before deciding, she wanted to learn more about galaxy evolution, which you will hear more about tonight. So Vivian is a current PhD candidate, as mentioned before, working on galaxies and massive clusters with Dr. Adam Muzzin. And in particular, her focus is uh, looking inside these clusters, galaxy evolution and tracing the evolution of the Milky Way back in time with some of these high redshift galaxies. Um, Vivian will be telling us more about all of that and, of course, early galaxies in our universe in her talk tonight, so I'm not going to spoiler it. And as we are looking to travel further and further back in time during this talk, I was thinking about telling you a time traveling joke, but everyone didn't like it. So without any further ado, uh, Vivian, please take it and us away. So thank you for the lovely introduction, Elena. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Vivian. I am a PhD student at York University, and I like to study galaxies. So today I'm going to talk about an aspect of galaxy evolution that's quite fascinating, but might not be one that you normally think about, and that is galaxy quenching. Quenching. Now that's a weird term. What could that be? Well, the process of quenching is how galaxies die. Don't worry, it won't be too gruesome, or at least I'll spare the more gruesome details. At the very least, the images you'll see will be spectacular. So galaxies are very pretty. Here is a galaxy, this is the one we live in, the Milky Way. It contains stars and gas and all that. So within the Milky Way, there are young stars and there are old stars. Younger stars, like the Sun, live in the galactic disk, inside one of the Milky Way's spiral arms. Older stars live in the bulge, or in the galactic halo. So you may be wondering, why are there only young stars in the disk. Well, it's because of all this cold, dense gas. So why is cold gas important? Well, the sun was formed in a nebula of cold gas, like the ones you see here. On the left, we have the Orion Nebula, and on the right, the Eagle Nebula. Nebulae are places where cold, dense gas can condense, and when they condense enough, then they can form stars. The cold gas and the replenishing of this cold gas is very important for the continuous cycle of star formation. So galaxies have cold gas. And what else about them indicates star formation? Well, earlier I showed an illustration of the Milky Way and the spiral arms are blue. That's because ongoing star formation will produce a lot of bright O and B type stars. And you can see they produce a lot of blue light. They also, unfortunately, do not live very long, only millions of years compared to our sun, which has a lifespan of only around, ten, ten, of around 10 billion years. If galaxies are glowing blue, then they must be forming stars regularly enough to make these short-lived bright blue stars. But with every round of star formation, 
some of the cold gas gets used up, and smaller and smaller stars are formed, and the redder their light is. Now let's ask, how long will the Milky Way be able to form stars? What if all our cold gas ran out? What then? Well, then our galaxy's young blue stars would die, and we'd only be left with redder, dimmer stars because they can live for billions and even trillions of years. When our galaxy runs out of star-forming gas, it will only have these red dwarf stars that remain. Throughout the universe, there are actually a lot of these red, dead galaxies. They only contain the oldest, longest living red colored stars from their last generation of star formation. Galaxies can pretty much divide, be divided up into star forming blue galaxies and red quiescent dead galaxies that can no longer form stars. But here's the thing, all galaxies must have been star forming at some point in their past. And today, despite there being many galaxies that are quiescent, there are still star forming galaxies. So how come the Milky Way is still actively forming stars, but these galaxies shown here are not? How did they lose their star forming gas? So in other words, how did they quench? Part one, what is quenching? So we all know about a star's life cycle. Uh, a star is born from a gravitationally collapsing gas cloud, and then it gets hot enough for fusion and it becomes a main sequence star. Star does nuclear fusion for millions or billions of years until it runs out of hydrogen inside its core, becomes a red giant, and then it explodes and ejects its insides into another nebula. And the gas from that nebula will go on to form another generation of stars. So this is happening inside our Milky Way and other star forming galaxies. So what stopped this cycle in quiescent galaxies? As stated before, stars can only form when there is cold, dense gas and hot diffuse gas such as the gas in the bulge or the galactic halo, cannot condense to form stars. And the process through which galaxies lose all their cold star forming gas and become quiescent is known as quenching. So the name is interesting because it implies that something has consumed all of the gas, but basically as long as all the cold gas is gone, then the galaxy is quenched. So quenching methods can be divided into four main categories. Gas does not accrete, gas cannot form stars, gas is used up rapidly, or gas is removed. So first up, gas does not accrete. So the one method that falls under this category is called cosmological starvation. So galaxies are formed inside halos and over the course of a galaxy's lifetime, it draws in a lot of gas from the intergalactic medium surrounding it. But some galaxies are less lucky and they happen to form in a halo that doesn't have much cold gas in the first place. So it uses up that cold gas in it in several rounds of star formation, and then it becomes quiescent. So the time scale for this has been shown to be many billions of years. So most galaxies wouldn't simply quench from just from a lack of gas from its surroundings. So let's look at some other quenching methods that are perhaps a bit faster. The second category is gas cannot form stars. So these methods usually involve the cold gas inside the galaxy becoming too hot for star formation. And one method is called morphological quenching. So spiral galaxies, they have regions of high and low density, and that is where we get the star spiral arms from. These density waves can actually funnel the cold gas along with some stars towards the galactic center where it bulges, and there, the more random motions of matter in the bulge will heat up this cold gas and not allow it to form any more stars. And this also results in a galaxy becoming less disc-shaped and more bulge-dominated. What's interesting is that simulations show barred spirals may quench this way more efficiently than non-barred ones. And some of you may recall that our Milky Way contains a bar. So what does this mean? Uh, some research says that the Milky Way might not be as actively star forming as other spiral galaxies. So maybe the Milky Way is quenching right now. So the next two methods involve something external heating up the cold gas. This is gravitational heating and thermal evaporation. So the galaxy would be interacting with something else and then through this interaction, the gas 
heats up too much and then it can no longer form stars. Uh, gravitational heating shown on the top, um, this external uh, interaction, it comes from other galaxies and it and through the gravitational interactions with them, it heats up the gas. And thermal evaporation shown on the bottom happens when a galaxy falls into a cluster. And so the cluster's hot gas um, is uh, surrounds the galaxy and then it heats up the cold gas inside the galaxy. And so now it can no longer form stars. And the third case is something called stellar feedback or supernova feedback. So we know that supernovae can be highly energetic. And so the image on the bottom, that's uh, of an illustration of SN 1987A. And look at those giant rings of heated gas. So when many supernova happen rapidly inside a galaxy, instead of forming more nebulae of cold gas that can lead to the next generation of stars, there's just so much energy that the gas becomes too hot and now it can no longer form stars. And the fourth thing that can heat up gas too much is AGN feedback. So AGN or active galactic nucleus is when the central supermassive black hole of a galaxy is actively accreting or drawing in material. The material around the black hole is very energetic and em emits a lot of radiation. This radiation can affect the rest of the galaxy. Since AGN are very violent and energetic, then they can heat up the gas in the region surrounding it and prevent it from forming more stars. This is why most galaxies, even if their black hole isn't active, have a reddened bulge with hot diffused gas. But if the AGN is powerful enough, then the entire galaxy's cold gas can become too hot for star formation. So the next category is the gas is used up too rapidly. So these methods are when your galaxy is just too eager to form stars, and so much so that they use up all of their star-forming gas in one spectacular event called a starburst, but then now they're dead. So one of the most well-known quenching methods is what's known as a galaxy merger. Because, I mean, just look at these images. It's just so spectacular. So major mergers are when two or more galaxies of similar mass are drawn to each other due to their gravity, and then they start to merge into one galaxy. It's like an intergalactic fusion dance. The gases all collide with each other because they're fluid, and then the cold gas will condense a lot, so then there's lots of star formation. But then eventually, all the gas is used up, and the merger likely turns into a quiescent elliptical galaxy. So another method that uses up gas really rapidly is what is called disk instabilities or compaction. And this is something that is observed more in the early universe, and it's less so uh, less observed today. And basically what happens is the galactic disk of a star-forming galaxy, it becomes unstable at some point, probably might be triggered by stellar feedback, and then it starts to compact in on itself. And then when it compacts, it consumes the gas because when you push the gas together, uh, it's going to collide and it's going to condense, and then it'll start rapidly forming a lot of stars. And then once this is over, uh, the galaxy finally settles into a red nugget galaxy that is sort of similar to an elliptical galaxy, but it's much smaller. And the final method that uses up gas really rapidly to form stars is, oh, it's the AGN again. And as we said before, AGN are really energetic. So then they can also trigger lots of star formation within a galaxy when they're there because they drive these galactic winds that sort of interact with this interstellar medium. And then that, instead of like heating up the gas, it also sort of makes, pushes the gas together and then it forms a lot of stars. And then after that happens, then, you know, the galaxy quenches. So AGN has show, shown up twice now. And now we move on to the fourth category where uh, the star forming gas is just removed from the galaxy. So something is just like ejecting it straight out of the galaxy. And the first we'll talk about is what's called ram pressure stripping. And so this happens when you have a galaxy and it's falling into a cluster. And so the momentum of it's falling causes this ram pressure against you know, the intercluster medium of this galaxy cluster and then so it's sort of like a wind that is like pushing 
all of the cold gas from inside the galaxy out. So this wind is sort of similar to the wind that you feel when you're going really fast on a bike, but you're going so fast that your hair falls out. That's kind of a scary analogy, but that's what random pressure stripping is. So another stripping method is what's called viscous stripping. So this is also uh, caused by the interaction of gas within a cluster and also the gas inside the galaxy. But then there's sort of this density difference between the hot gas that is in the cluster versus the colder gas that's in the galaxy. And there's more of like a viscous interaction. So it sort of like drags the gas out as opposed to just pushing it out like in ram pressure. And so the picture shown here, this is what is called a jellyfish galaxy. And it's called that because if you look at these tails it has, it sort of makes the galaxy resemble a jellyfish. So this cold gas is being ram pressure stripped out and it's glowing blue. So that means that they might actually be forming stars as the gas is being pushed out of the galaxy. So that's cr pretty interesting. So next up is what is called tidal stripping. It's also called harassment. So this is when you have a lot of galaxies that are close enough to affect each other gravitationally, but they don't exactly merge. So then the gravitational interactions, it causes some of the gas to be stripped off one or both of these galaxies. And then they just keep doing that until you know they're, they're, they're just out of gas. And uh, I think this is probably called harassment because you know, it happens repeatedly in groups of galaxies that are in close proximity. So it's kind of like, you know, they're like teasing each other. And you can also see from this image, I mean, uh, I did draw like angry eyes on top of them, but like these are real galaxies and the smaller galaxy, like you notice, it's more, it's a bit more red than the, than the other galaxy because it's all, you know, it's losing gas. So it's already quenching. So that's pretty cool. And what is the last method of removing gas from a galaxy? It's Aegean feedback, again. So Aegean winds, they can drive massive outflows of gas from the galaxy. Um, and as we all know, Aegean are really famous for their central jets where the highly energetic particles from the accretion disk, it's just like ejected out at extremely high velocities. So these jets can cause these really violent winds which just blows out all the star forming gas straight out of the galaxy. So I guess you can say that AGN, they're just full of hot air. So, you know, you've got this like star forming galaxy is just minding its own business, happily forming new stars. And then the AGN inside it is like, I'm gonna ruin this galaxy's entire career. Also here's um, a joke I made for all you Avatar The Last Airbender fans out there. Uh, if any of my friends are watching, you know what you know what this is talking about. Anyway, let's move on. So here, so here's we. Uh, there's this thing that my supervisor Adam always says, which is that galaxies are kind of like people. They're very diverse, and no two galaxies are exactly the same. They have personalities. And one thing about people that we're always wondering is if someone's personality comes from nature or nurture. And this is the same with galaxies. So did this galaxy quench because of its internal processes, which is nature, or its external environment, nurture? So self-driven quenching is when the galaxy's own internal mechanisms make it use up all of its cold gas. And when astronomers say this, they mostly mean AGN feedback because you know it's just very common. But like other things that fall under self-quenching is you have morphological quenching or stellar feedback or disk instabilities. And environment-driven quenching, so you know, that's the nurture side of things. So the galaxy loses its star forming cold gas due to like outside influences. So it could be like proximity to other galaxies or you're interacting with a galaxy cluster. So you know, you've got the mergers and the stripping and harassment and heating. The thing is, a lot of these processes can happen at the same time. So, you know, you can have mergers and AGN and your galaxy can start off with like morphological quenching, but then it like falls into a galaxy cluster and then it just ram pressure strip. So it's not black and white, just like how people are both a combination of nature and nurture, so are galaxies. And that brings us to part two. Can we tell how a galaxy is quenched? 
So here I'm going to briefly discuss my research. Um, I will try not to make it be too technical, but please bear with me. So uh, astronomers generally notice that there are more quiescent galaxies that are inside a denser environment, like a galaxy cluster versus a less dense environment, which we just call the field. So clearly environment plays a big role in how and why galaxies stop forming stars. But as mentioned before, um, you have like self quenching and environmental quenching at the same time. So how do you like separate these two? Um, you know, just because there's a lot of quiescent galaxies in a cluster doesn't mean that uh, every single one of them was only quenched by environmental quenching. You know, some of them may have self quenched before they became part of the cluster. So how can we tell? Uh, is it even possible to tell? So here's something interesting about the morphology of galaxies. So some quenching processes, it changes how the galaxy looks, it goes from disk to bulge. And this is known as morphological transformation. But of course, other galaxies, they don't really change how they look when they quench. So it starts off as a disk, it ends up as a disk, it starts off as a bulge, it ends up as a bulge. Um, so yeah. So then you know that galaxies, you know, they change a lot in their colors when they go from star forming to quiescent, you know, they go from like mostly blue to mostly red. And then this can like obscure our view of how the underlying mass is evolving or if it's evolving at all. But what if you don't focus on the light from the galaxy and you just look at where the stars are? So my research is to very carefully map out the stellar mass of both star forming and quiescent galaxies in different environments and then compare them. So then these pictures that you see here, um, this isn't just the light, this isn't the light from the galaxy, this is like more the mass of the stars. So we have these stellar mass maps and that will hopefully allow us to have a more accurate picture of how these stars get shuffled around and moved when galaxies quench. So if you ignore the color of the light, and just focus on the mass distribution. Uh, there are actually a lot of quiescent galaxies in the cluster that have pretty much the same morphology, so the exact same shape as star-forming field galaxies. Uh, so next up, I'm gonna show a really boring plot, but if you stay with me, it's going to be pretty revealing. So for galaxies and clusters, um, you have a lot of bulge dominated galaxies that tend to be more massive. And you and then we also see that less massive galaxies, so these red things here, so these are disks. So it looks like there's like a difference in the size of these galaxies. So so quenched disks are typically less massive and quenched bulges are typically more massive. So you wouldn't really think that environmental quenching would discriminate, but it seems that it does by stellar mass. But why? I mean, most of the methods, they're just stripping the gas out of the galaxy. Why would it matter if it's a big galaxy or a small galaxy? So, you know, why is there a difference? So here are some reasons why it might be, why, why this, you know, it seems to exist. Um, Low mass galaxies, uh, it might get stripped easier because they just have less gravity to hang on to the gas or they just have less gas to strip in the first place, right? Uh, because they're smaller. So, so that's one reason. And another reason is lower mass galaxies, they might be more subject to heating. Uh, lower mass galaxies, uh, they would merge into high, higher mass galaxies. And as we can see from mergers, uh, they, they always like take something from like being a disc to like being like a bulge elliptical galaxy. So, you know, that might be what's happening. And on the other side of things, uh, when we look at like self quenching, uh, they seem to like prefer like galaxies that are more massive. So higher mass galaxies, they tend to have more AGN and higher mass galaxies, they seem to be more starbursty or they seem to have more compaction. So we look at this again, this kind of shows that like the more massive a galaxy is, uh, they seem to like quench like with like these different methods than like lower mass galaxies 
that seem to like, you know, prefer like other kinds of quenching, right? I mean, you know, this is in general. I mean, you can still see that like uh, environmental quenching can still affect some some higher mass galaxies, but in general, they tend like a higher, like a more massive galaxy will tend to like prefer to be like more self-quenched and will become a bulge. So we can see from this that, you, you know, galaxies are just very dynamic and they really do have their own personalities. And now, now that we've learned all their, uh, learned all of that about the nature versus nurture, when it comes to galaxy quenching, uh, let's go back in time. So what is like a mostly complete picture of galaxy evolution that we have like as far as we know today? So all the galaxies that I've shown before up to this point, they're either from the local universe, so at redshift zero, or they're at in intermediate redshift. So the story up to this point is only what has been happening for the last like 7 billion years. Uh, that's only half the universe's lifespan. So can we go further than that? So now we look at galaxies that are from redshift one to redshift three. So that's about 7.8 to 11.5 billion years ago. And now this uh, epoch is what's commonly called cosmic noon. Yes, that's where the peak of cosmic star formation is. So at this redshift, most galaxies, they're forming crazy amount of stars. Like the star formation rate is just nothing that you would see today. Uh, but they're not forming them all uniformly all, over, all across their disk. Like if you look at these pictures, like they're really, these galaxies are really clumpy. They're forming stars in these star forming clumps. Uh, one of the people in my research group, uh, he has written extensively about these clumpy galaxies. And he also used a special method called deconvolution to study them, which is sort of like, you know, you're trying to like get like more resolution from like ground based uh, telescopes. It's like, it's really very interesting. So that's what you see on the left. And on the right, I just included some other clumpy galaxies that come from like a sample of high redshift galaxies that I'm currently working on. And yeah, so it's just, it's just really weird. Now let's go even further back in time. So here we have redshift three to six. So now that it's 11.5 to 12.8 billion years ago. And so at that point, like most galaxies are they're just starting to form, right? So, you know, they're still like building up most of their stars, but we see that there's like some giant massive galaxies that have already formed at, at this time. And like, keep in mind, this is just one to 2 billion years after the big bang, the universe is very young. And yet these galaxies have a hundred billion solar masses. So think about it, the Milky Way took 13.7 billion years to build up a hundred billion solar masses. And then these galaxies, they only took one to 2 billion years. So, maybe these galaxies, they might eventually become like these bright central galaxies that like dominate the center of clusters. So, you know, think like M87, you know, the one where like we got that picture of the black hole. So like, they're kind of like the final bosses of galaxies. And here we're like watching them form. This is kind of like a villain origin story if you think about it. And finally, here's a picture of the most distant galaxy ever discovered, GNZ11. So this formed only 400 million years after the Big Bang. But this galaxy is also really massive. It also has about 100 billion stars. But like, think about it, like the universe is only 400 million years old. This is, this is wild. And so this is just like a sampling of what's out there. But now that, you know, the JJUG UST has finally launched and it has even, you know, sent back like the first images. I mean, you know, they're just test images, but like the JWST is going to look further than ever before. It's going to like find all, you know, a lot more of these galaxies at like, you know, redshift three, redshift six, redshift eight, uh, and even, you know, even higher. And what's great about the JWST is like, we're not just going to see like the most massive galaxies. Like we're going to see a lot of smaller galaxies that we couldn't see in the past, like not even with Hubble. And also, um, if you're interested in these massive galaxies, like JWST can also help us learn a lot about them as well, because there's evidence that these massive galaxies, they quench like super early. So like 
at causing noon, they're probably already dead. So then with, with JWST, we'll get to see how they quench. So that's really exciting. And in conclusion, galaxies, they're really complicated and quenching is really just as complicated. But we'll still find a way to study galaxies because they're just so weird and wonderful. And remember, AGN are hungry and they want your cold gas. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. It's uh, obviously, uh, despite audio issues, we've gotten through it, and it was absolutely worth it. Uh, left us all thinking about uh, quenching and uh, quintets and quotients of quiescence and other quarrelsome Q type events in the universe, especially what they mean for how galaxies evolve. And of course, thanks for your uh, Avatar Last Airbender meme. <laughs> Very topical, as it was in this case, indeed. Uh, we were looking uh, looking for the light, as you say. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, or as, as they say, and uh, finding, well, uh, galaxies in this case, lots of galaxies. And speaking of lots of things, it uh, looks like we also have quite a few questions coming your way. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, we'll be able to, to get, but we're going to go over and I'm going to pass off to Emma for questions from YouTube. Take it away, Emma. Yeah, so first question comes in from Lewis. How do you expect the James Webb Telescope to change our understanding of this quenching process? Um, oh, so that's a really good question. Um, I think that like one of the th key mysteries uh, as I have probably brought up before is that like, you know, we have these really, really massive galaxies um, that we're seeing like that they formed really early. And a lot of people are like a lot of scientists think that like, because they're so massive, they probably uh, just formed, you know, a lot of stars and then they just became quiescent and because quenching is so complicated and there's like so many different ways that that can happen uh no one is for sh like sure exactly how it happened like we just sort of have like an idea you know from simulations and stuff but not a lot of it is really confirmed by observations because you know the further back in time you look you know all the galaxies just kind of look like weird blobs so with jwst and with its uh increased resolution like we can actually you know, say for certain, you know, how how these massive galaxies quenched. That's very cool. Thank you. Um, next question comes in from Joshua Parsons. Does the environment, uh, gas density or proton flux, affect the temperature that gas quenches at? Uh, so that is uh, really uh, kind of not my expertise. Um, but, uh, so I don't think I can really answer that, uh, too well. Um, but I think that it kind of mostly, a lot of it kind of depends on like less, like less on like the microscopic level and more on just kind of like classical mechanics, like big picture stuff. Um, you know, like. The, like the difference between let's say like ram pressure stripping versus uh, viscous stripping, for example, is sort of like the angle at which like the galaxy is like falling into the cluster, you know? So like, if it's more like face on, like then ram pressure will be more of a thing. If it's more edge on, then like there's more of a drag and it's more like viscous stripping. Uh, so like, I think maybe possibly if you look at like heating, it's, probably like similar idea so i don't know it might not have really answered the question but like i i don't know i i i work mostly with observation that might be more of like a like a hydrodynamical simulation question <laughs> so yeah well thank you anyways um next question comes in also from lewis um are these dying or dead galaxies further away from us, um, say further than 2 million light years, or are they also closer? Oh yeah, so that's that's a pretty good question. Um, I think that we we see like more, we see more um, quenched galaxies like further away from us just because, you know, the, the further you look, like, you know, you're looking at like a wider like area, right? Um, 
So, you know, if you, if, if they're, if you're looking closer, you know, you're kind of like seeing a smaller region of the universe, kind of just like seeing like what's around the Milky Way mostly. And so that's why like, you know, we're, so we, we don't live in a very dense region of space. Like we're kind of more like in the field, right. Than like in the cluster. And because you're in the field, you have, you just naturally have more star forming galaxies. So I guess that's why, like, when you look further, uh, you see like more quench galaxies. Uh, but it doesn't really say much about, I don't know, um, anything except like, you know, where, where we're located in the universe, I guess. Right. Um, this question also comes in from Lewis. Does this quenching have any effect in the accelerating? Sorry, does this question have any effect in the accelerating the expansion of the universe? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, so, um, the expansion of the universe, that's like dark energy, right? Uh, I think dark energy, nobody really understands much about it, but it's kind of happening on such a large cosmological scale that it wouldn't really like e like even like on the scale of galaxies at least like right now um it's way too small to really like be affected um by like the expansion of the universe at least like right now yeah um next question comes in from Joshua Parsons, have you ever seen the relativistic jet of an AGN impact other galaxies outflow, um, for example, in a cluster? Oh, that that's a really good question. Um, personally, I mean, in my research and in the papers I've read, I haven't seen that uh, happen. Um, it could possibly happen. Uh, you know, I guess, maybe we, we just haven't really seen it yet. Uh, but I mean, I think that most galaxies are kind of like really far apart from each other that like they, they don't tend to like interact too much with each other. But yeah, no, I don't think uh, that that has been seen happening. So like, I, I don't really know why, but yeah. Cool. Um, this next question comes in from Alistair McNamara. If a galaxy merger can lead to quenching, might the merger of the Milky Way and the Andromeda cause some trouble for our great, great grandchildren? <laughs> yeah, I guess that uh, it, you know, it would probably just, you know, turn like the Milky Way and Andromeda into, you know, just like a dead elliptical galaxy. Uh, it won't cause too much trouble though, because um, stars, like when a merger happens, they don't really like interact with each other because they're actually just so far apart. They just kind of like, are like, you know, they, you know, they don't collide. They just sort of like zoom around and say, oh, whatever. Um, it might like the, it might trigger like a, a lot of like, you know, really rapid star formation like a starburst like i mentioned so there might be a lot of new stars uh in this like amalgam of like the andromeda and the milky way and maybe like you could be like hey that means we'll have like more solar systems and more planets but you know that's like billions of years into the future so you know we don't we will we won't be around to see it <laughs> very very cool um Next up from Yasin, how and when will the Milky Way become a quenched galaxy? So a bit related. Ooh, so so this is actually a pretty tricky question. So, you know, like the Milky Way, uh, even though it is currently star forming and we like, like to think of it as a star forming galaxy, there are some astronomers who are like, actually the Milky Way shouldn't be considered a star forming galaxy. It should be considered what is called a green valley galaxy. So like a galaxy that's transitioning between like being star forming and quiescent because they're saying that like, we're not forming as many stars as like other uh, spiral galaxies, you know, and like, 
and we also have like a bar and stuff like that, right? And then, but then there's also some people are saying that like, no, the Milky Way should actually be considered a quiescent galaxy um, because it actually is like so low in star formation. But like, you know, we we're just like kind of biased because like we're inside it, inside of it. So like, we're like, oh, it's still forming stars. It can't be quenched. But like, you know, they're like, they're saying that it's already quenched. Of course, like, you know, if you think of it as like, oh, it's still like a star forming galaxy that's chugging along, then it will be quenched like 100% when like we merge with Andromeda, like for sure, for sure. Um, very nice. Um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, this one comes in from Andy. Could you recommend a source for further reading? Uh... <laughs> Um, I don't know if there are that many, uh, I don't, I don't actually know if there's like popular science books that are written about this. Uh, I mean, okay, let me think. Uh, I think, I believe nature astronomy has like a letter that's like kind of like more accessible to the public that sort of talks about how massive galaxies quench um let's see uh i believe it is written by uh sorry just give me one second uh so it's written by allison mann and serial belly so it's very quick it's only like uh four pages and it just basically like summarizes it uh but like as far as like you know like like popular science articles or popular science books about quenching, I I don't I, I don't think that there is a like easily accessible source. There's mostly just like papers written by astronomers for other astronomers. Oh uh I think oh the the the, the there's Dr. Becky on YouTube. Uh she has made a video that's also about galaxy quenching. Honestly, I think she explained it way better than I can. So uh, if you look up like Dr. Becky, uh, her videos like will ex also talk about quenching in an accessible way. So yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Um, okay, I think this is our last question, it looks like. Um, this one comes in from Betty. Would the merger of two galaxies affect the relationship between a sun and its stars? For example, could the Earth be thrown off of its orbit? Oh, that's a really, really good question. So uh, I guess like the short answer is we don't really know because, um, you know, it's like way too chaotic, right? There's like a lot of different things happening. So we know like 100% or like almost 100% that like stars won't collide. But yes, like stars could, you know, pass by really close. And then, yeah, maybe like some planets might just like get thrown off and like, you know, be ejected away. Um, so when the Milky Way merges with Andromeda, I believe that at that point, so I'm not like 100% certain, but like I think at that point the, the sun would have already um, exploded. So like we don't have to worry about this because, you know, the solar system is already destroyed. But like for other solar systems, it, it, it could be that maybe like, you know, because of all of the like random motions of the stars, some of the planets do like just get kicked out. So yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Um, that's it for the questions for tonight. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, then I guess it's over to me to say thank you once again, Vivian. This, this has been a uh, fabulous talk, and I, I'm sure we could all stay here talking quite a bit more about galaxies and all of their fun behaviors. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have time, so we will have to stop here. And uh, thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. Uh, this famous uh, 2 2022 and um, with that I think it is time to hand over to our wonderful president Tom Luton who is the president of the Toronto Center RASC finish us off for the evening so take it away Tom thank you very much Elena so good evening everyone uh, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, well here in Toronto on this damp uh, Wednesday evening so let's get into our announcements 
So we've got two types of meetings here online on YouTube. What you've just had is one of our speaker nights, and then in two weeks' time is going to be one of our recreational astronomy nights, uh, in which a member of the uh, Toronto Center, members of the Toronto Center, will be talking about uh, projects and topics and so forth. So if you're here for YouTube, here on YouTube, and you're watching us live, please say hello in the chat. Uh, please enter some questions for presenters, like other people have done. Uh, if you're a new member, please introduce yourself. And if you're coming from far, far away, uh, somewhere well outside of the Toronto area, please uh, introduce yourself and let us know where you're from. So coming up on the 2nd of March at 7.30 p.m. here on YouTube uh, for our next Recreational Astronomy Night meeting, Dennis Dre will be hosting The Sky This Month. John Reed and Chris Vaughn will be discussing introdu introducing 110 Things to See with a Telescope, a new book for finding and viewing the Messier objects. And Dennis uh, Zaitsev, uh, we'll be discussing the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, the new generation of the ground-based observatories, uh, here live on YouTube. Uh, if you'd like to present something, please contact Paul Markov. Our next speaker's night is on the 16th of March, 7.30 p.m. Shamira Andres will be uh, talking about exploring the Martian cryosphere, a treasure map of ice on Mars. Coming up the DDO in the next few weeks, this Saturday, 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. is DDO Up in the Sky. Uh, there's a $12.50 registration fee. Uh, links to the registration documents can be found at rasktio.ca. Then in March on the 11th is the DDO Astronomy Speakers Night, $12.50 registration fee. Uh, DDO Ask an Astronomer is on Sunday, March the 13th at 1 p.m. 565 uh, fee for that. Again, links at rasto.ca. And then coming up uh, during March break, we've got some additional programming. Uh, on Monday, March the 14th, uh, from 2 to 4, is Out of This World, the Solar System. And then... Um, Tuesday, March 15th, 12 p.m. to 1.30. And again on Thursday, March 17th, same time, is Sun Fun. In both cases, $10 registration fee. Links at rasto.ca. Uh, so if you've been busy uh, doing some observing lately and you've had a chance to take a stab at one of our observing certificates, this is the point where I get to remind you that if you're just about to finish the project, or if you have finished, please fill out the paperwork so we can get you your, your certificate and PIN. And if you haven't and are looking for something to do, um, I'd like to recommend one of our many observing certificate programs. We've got Explore the Universe, Explore the Moon and Binoculars or Telescopes, Messier Catalog, the finest NGCs, that's new general catalog objects, uh, Double Stars, Isabel Williamson Lunar Certificate, Deep Sky Gems, and Deep Sky Challenge. Full details for all of these are at rask.ca slash certificate dash programs. It's a broken record, but observing sessions are still suspended until further notice due to the pandemic. Uh, Baby Village Park, Long Sioux Conservation Area, and the Ontario Science Center. Uh, the CAO is open but the road is clogged with snow. So you're getting the, getting in the last kilometer or so is a bit of a challenge, um, but there is availability. Um, please read everything on the website uh, before making your booking. Um, we have a, uh, the facility is currently limited to a single member or family upstairs in the house. And then, um, the rest of the facility would be for um, uh, not staying overnight. Uh, this is where I get to plug the benefits of RASC membership. Um, we are the largest and oldest uh, astronomical amateur organization in Canada. Been around for decades. Uh, if you've you're a existing member looking to renew, please do so. Secure.rask.ca. You can do this online. Um, if you're a longtime member and COVID has thrown some difficulties your way, the Rask does have an emergency fund. 
Um, it's completely confidential. Uh, full details are available by emailing at mempub at rask.ca. The National Office also sells gifts memberships. And with that, I'd like to wish you a pleasant evening. I want to thank you very much for joining us. You can follow us on all the forms of social media. Uh, if you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe. Click the notification bell for updates. Uh, so stay, stay safe and keep looking up. Good night, everybody.